couple weeks later, he's telling me this story, like we're having dinner or something, and sort of talking shop. He's like, well, this thing happened to me when I was teaching. I said, and I'm like, you said what? <laughs> you did what? I. What? Well, how long did you yeah, it's been a long time. Two weeks. Yes, but uh, two, just two weeks, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, Kelly Gill just ran a story covering. I know. Your body's not good. Oh, yeah. How long has this fraternity been on campus? Just a year. Okay. Just on our anniversary. <laughs> How many of you are active? There's five of us, plus Bert, Alberto, and others. Okay. We're working at DSP. Right, 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 right. And we're actually adding two more. Okay. okay. So this is, the, are you all members here? That's the community. Okay. There's more. Okay. You two more people? Well, some are not coming from Sunday. Oh, I guess you're, I have to leave by evening That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Are you even just having a conversation with you okay. at least? Uh -huh. And you know you're part of being video too. I had this mistake Saturday. <laughs> I, was saying, I was saying something stupid and uh, it got caught on the camera. I don't know if it got caught because actually okay. someone has been getting caught for sound. Oh, okay. I have caught okay. okay. all the camera. Anthony, have you met? Well, I have Mr. Velasquez. Hi, I'm Mr. Ortiz. You haven't met, right? That's in your house. Well, that's the what? No, that's the what? I know. During most of this students are in Professor Bedrosi's class, which doesn't get our consent. Oh, okay. That's what they have coming into the Okay. Whose class? Professor Bedrosi, the new one. Oh, yes. Who's that? Um, she's a PhD candidate for the history department, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. So she teaches a class on the Mexican migration. Oh, okay. From Berkeley? Yeah, you can work with me. Okay. So it's not, it's not Professor Beth Cohen, because she's the other person who does not have to be No. Okay. And then she's the other person who does not have to be Okay. And then for the last Saturday, too, she's very nice. Okay. Good to you. said there was somebody in sociology? Yes, but um, he's from Puerto Rico from New York. I don't know. Yeah, Carl Lopez. He's from Puerto Rico. He's from uh, actually, no. Have you been taking classes for him? Yes, I've taken actually three classes. Oh my goodness. What is he teaching? Uh, sociology. So, my last year, he had a class on Latino sociology. Okay. Which is really interesting. I hope he teaches that. Okay. Um, that's political sociology and then one on Latin American development. Okay. Um, and he's, is he like tenure friends in sociology or is he? Okay. So, he's full time Okay. And he's from New York. New York? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Cooney. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's pretty proud of his Yeah. Okay. That's right. Your tenure is still a very I'm sorry, what? Your tenure is still over. I am the only one, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the Phyllis in history is, is, do you know, she's tenure, tenure line? No, no, she's not, no, she's a grad student. A grad student from Berkeley. I don't know where she is. I hear she's in California, so I know she's in California. Okay. But she's from LA. Okay. 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 How do you uh, Central Valley? And tell me the, the, the guy in sociology, what's his last name? Carl Lopez. Carl Lopez. Carl Lopez. So C A R O Lopez. Yeah. Carl Lopez. I, I, okay. I met someone once from San Francisco, yeah, from um, Bakersfield. Um, oh, is it the same thing that he said? She no, she said she was from LA. You know, and I thought, that's a little stretch. That's, that's, all that's all stretching it. Yeah, yeah that's a great line. Yeah. yeah, that's stretching it. Yeah. Huh. And that's, it wasn't Sarah Phil. No. Sarah right. soccer class this weekend. Last weekend. Sarah. Oh, yeah. She's awesome. The Wolf of Latino. She is awesome. Sarah Kim is my friend. She's here. She's 
Actually, it's great. The mass. The mass, okay, okay. It's up to As uh, someone said, it would take me to the mass for the first time. Ah, okay, all right. <laughs> wow. It takes me to drag me to mass. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. You would have to be there if you were going to be there. <laughs> you would have to take yourself. She is a fantastic. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's really remarkable, like all the the, the alums who stay in DC and then we get to kind of have our lives as run. I mean, you do a better job of keeping in touch with them than I do, but um, you know, Corrine, Monica, Sarah, Emily. Vincent is a lot more. Yes, she is. Springs crowd, you got the Cathedral City, you got Rancho Mirage, Super Wendy, and Palm Desert. I don't know what that is, the but I'm living in the ghetto. 
actual look at it. Yeah, I thought it's very nice. You know, it's, it's a weird place because yeah. it was sort of like when, when LA started to get really, really populated, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons that a lot of people would not want to live in the desert, right? Especially because it's so hot. Um, but it, it's actually a fairly healthy place to live, and, and um, it eventually became like this, this resort retirement place, right? Um, but it's got a, uh, if you go further, if you go like further east, you know, into the, the parts of the desert that are irrigated where there is sort of agriculture happening, right? So there are migrant communities that live there. Um, but it's, it's a really weird part of the state. It's not, it's not close to California. And then during the nice weather, tons of people from Canada come. Yes, it's like Florida. You know. <laughs> they, can, yeah. they, go, they go there. So it's a complex. So the stable population you know, runs the city, and most of the Latinos have jobs in the hotels and the casinos. It's the Indian. There are, there's a native uh, group there that I'm not sure of the name But they own half the land. And so the parcels are, it's like a checkerboard of Indian land. And they, if you, you most half the people there lease their land from this, this, this Indian group, you know, that has a relationship. And they run the casinos. And, um, and it's a small band. And I told them very, they're very well to do. It's also a really interesting place, like it's mostly, you're on the desert floor, but right next to Palm Springs, just south of the of town, there are these mountains that just like grow, yeah. shoot up, you know, like 3,000 feet. Yeah. It's really, really dramatic. So you can go from on a summer day 110, and then go up on a tram, and you'll be at 40 degrees, okay. 50 degrees. I've actually, I, I, I remember driving to Palm Springs while it's in. And just watching the mountains slowly move by. I don't know what grew, but we were on it forever. Yeah. And this shield of mountains that would go by. Yeah, yeah. Slowly yeah. move by. And then the casinos like pop up up ahead. So I feel like it's mostly Interstate 10 or the one freeway, right? And yeah, they already freeway. merged at one point. So the 10 and the 60 come together and then that's the 10. If you take the 10, it goes into Phoenix and it goes all the way to Jackson, Florida. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, but no, it's it's um, and the wind farms are there, so you get the wind, the, the huge sort of like yeah. like fans and windmills up there too. It's a really and there's lots of, lots of things. New York is a very bizarre. It is. I think it's a fitting place for me. You will make it more. Fun. <laughs> yeah. 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 So there's you know there's you like Latino politics in New York City, and then there's there's gay politics in Palm Springs, and there's it's an international city and it's a small town. And it's all these tourists. And then there's all these retirees, and there's all these parties on the Dinah Shore. And there's all these golf classics, so you got people coming in. But that's got to be that central. There's some, oh, yeah, exactly. There's some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was making sure that the house I'm buying just was not a crystal meth lab. And the, the state law, you know, <laughs> they actually <laughs> check. <laughs> for, for well, they check, they actually have, they have a state law to test that it's not, it was never used as a crystal meth lab. I was shocked that this was like the crystal meth inspection. <laughs> Can you imagine the Ryan House? No, I'm sorry, sorry. I was half joking because I you know, know it's like yeah. in yeah. inland California, you were really poor, right? Is that. Did they make you pay for it? Yeah. The, uh, I, I don't know where the cost of part of the inspection. Yeah. Crystal meth check. Yeah. 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 Earthquakes. Flood zone, crystal map, <laughs> radon, um, the wind, there's wind, there was a wind check, yes. Yeah, radiation. That was at wind and sandstorm. Yeah. And the 100 year flood, 40 year flood. Very good growth rates. I want a, Very Egyptian. I want a complimentary tree. Oh, okay. All right. So growing up in Southern California, that was like one reason that you would go to Palm Springs is that, um, you know, one of the things that they produce on there were dates, and it's palm trees, right? So it's very Egyptian. Um, so, so Palm Springs would have the date festival, and they would go to the date queen, right? Um, and, they, and, and you could go and have date shakes, and these really, oh, these amazing, like very rich, sweet um, shakes made from dates. It's really amazing. See, the nice thing is, uh, I'm from Orange County, and I don't, I actually, I, I have pomegranates at home, and 
Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we actually sort of don't go through that in November or something like that. Oh, wow. I see my neck. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like a huge tree. And then, like, for the dates, we go to the middle school because they have, like, date palms outside of, of the middle yeah. school. It's like, I don't know, a couple blocks down the street. And we just go with, like, four or five. Throw rocks at the date, but it is like it's all good. You didn't get to there for the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, because it's in our backyard. But my mother had some, and neighbor, someone stole all her balloons once. I put a nail in it. She had the best one. The one thing is that that one. And we have another friend, some, one day someone took all her oranges. And it was in their backyard. I feel like now it's all avocado, now it's like a skinny yeah. one. Like, yeah. like, 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 like there, there, there's this giant avocado tree that, like, sort of borders between our house and the neighbor's house. It technically the tree is in their house, but the majority of it sort of hangs over a garage. So we have all, like, the leaf litter that we can clean up, and every fall, maybe that just justifies going up on the roof and just making half the avocados on that tree. Because we have to clean up the leaves anyways, right? So, um, Yes, it's the land of milk and honey. <laughs> Who needs to work? Who needs to work on the tree? Yes. Public space is too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, wait, does anyone want Rachel saw here? Let's have that conversation. Let's have to be going to class. survey was that, interesting, um, where do Latinos, this is the, they actually had a question like this, where do, where do Latinos get their, um, their um, information regarding moral issues, and in particular around, around same-sex marriage? And um, they, they also you know, asked specifically for what religion, so you had, you know, lead Latino and type of religion, so they could uh, parse out um, Protestant, evangelicals, and Catholics. And it was, it was quite stunning, and I was asked to, to write an op-ed up in the Washington Post, uh, which I did. And I, it was what I really uh, contemplated in that survey was the, the something like 67% of Latino Catholics receive their moral information from their family members. And they never heard from the pulpit, they, very little reporting from church regarding uh, why they would make a moral decision regarding uh, gay, gay issues. Whereas the Protestants, on the other hand, were very high, just the opposite, like 67%. Um, 
you know, that heard regular sermons regarding same-sex issues and against same-sex marriage. So the, the Latino community is very bifurcated on this in terms of uh, based on religion. The question is, uh, what's the turnout for votes? And the, the Latino Protestants in California are probably about 40%, and Catholics are probably at 60% presently, if they're, going to be, if they're religious. And there's a large portion of growing, especially among your age, that are not religious. They don't have a religious denomination. Um, they, you know, you may be spiritual, but you don't have a denomination. So that's growing. But the, my point is that um, I was thinking about this in relationship to what was just, you know, passed in Spain, in Portugal, and that was coming to Mexico, Mexico City, um, and subsequently in Argentina. Okay, so we have four, you know, um, Hispanic countries that are um, moving toward same-sex marriage. And so how, how do you, like, how do you problematize this, you know, in terms of, like, a social sociological issue. And so, in a nutshell, I would say this, that contrary to popular opinion, Catholics don't listen hear many sermons regarding sex at all, okay? Much, I mean, they don't hear much about marriage, much less same-sex marriage, and very little about gays. I mean, I don't think most priests want to touch it from the pulpit. Um, in the United States, or in Mexico, or in Chile, or anywhere else, you know, they just, they just don't discuss those issues. Okay, whereas evangelicals do, you know, in, in all the Latin countries, and there's very few evangelicals in Portugal or in Spain, so you, can, you know, see the distinguishment there. But um, so that's one thing. The source for moral decision making is coming from family members, and so if there is a experience of gays in the family, or uh, there's going to be that openness, generally speaking, because Latinos generally do not like, want to keep the families together, want to keep the families together. Now, and we know the Latino family is very complex today. So this is, that's another thing. I mean, especially in the United States, we have the highest rate of single parent households uh, as a ethnic group in the United States presently. Actually, like a two percentage points more than African Americans right now, and so we have a changing family structure in the United States. So you throw those together, and you see a kind of more intimate, personal, experiential way that Latinos are framing the moral issues, particularly regarding um, gay rights. And that's one one thing. So Latino Catholics in particular. So that I think that's one thing. But I think that's true in Latin America. I think that's it's the same things are dynamics going on. Family structure is changing in all the countries. This, this nuclear family business has actually never been the Latino way. We have extended family. And we have complex families. And we have migrant families where grandparents are taking care of children in the home country. We've got all this complexity that that um, actually I think when Latinos become Hispanic, I mean Latinos become evangelicals, they actually moving toward a more American model, toward uh, the moral life. They want a, a marriage, they want a family that's an intact family with the father, the mother. Especially Latinos become Mormons. That's what they're looking for. So but the by and large the people who stay Catholic or not only Catholic or is my mentor in Chile, um, Christian Parker, Christian Parker says, uh, it's the Philosophies belong even ever. Kind of like the, in, you know, Catholic is my way, and and my way is a very broad stretch, and so this this thing, you know, it's it's a very difficult thing to pinpoint. But I'm just going to say that it's very complex that we get our own decision making power if you're Catholic from your family. You're open to gay things. And one last thing before I, I give it over to my dear colleague here. Um, the other thing that I think is very important to know. And, and, I get called for my reporters all the time on this, on this question, right? I, this is like standard things. I, like, what I just told you was pretty standard. And the next thing I could say pretty standard is, um, in all Latin countries, in, I mean Latin America and in Spain and Portugal, civil marriage is the way. There are no Latin countries where the priest or minister or the rabbi or the mom has civil jurisdiction over marriage. And 
this has a large historical roots with regarding um, when Mexican independence or Argentinian independence, Argentine independence or Brazilian independence came in. The, one of the key things that the um, liberals wanted who were part of the revolution was the state to have the power to do all of the um, um, registries. So that if we would take the baptismal registry and move it into the state function. So that instead of having births recorded and you know historians get all their information through the colonial period through the baptismal registries of, of parishes and dioceses. And now we're going to move it to the state. So we got births in the state and marriages were now beginning to be recorded in the state, which used to be by the church too. Similarly with deaths in the, in the church registry, now by the state. And so civil marriage became an established thing to separate it. And so now we had, if you're, you know, if you have this phrase, maybe in some of your families, uh, we're going to get married, you know, por lo civil, or por la iglesia. And so there's an imagination, particularly for families who are from Latin America or from Europe, that see the distinguishment between the civil marriage and the religious marriage. And I bought the book in LA when I was working as a parish priest in the immigrant communities in Los Angeles. I was, one of the things I always had to tell the couple was, I actually do your civil marriage and I sign the license. Well, you do? Because I thought they were going to have to go up to the courthouse or something and all that. No, you just get the license and then I know I get double. You know, so I, you know, we don't have a double payment here. You can pay me double if you want. It says you don't have a two-stepper. You have a, you have the license, get it, and then come to me, and we'll do the double thing. And I think for a lot of Latins, the, the, when they hear this thing about this combination, and they they understand that there's a separation of civil marriage and religious marriage more easily than the rest of the population. I think. I think that gives us an advantage for those who want, say, you know, civil marriage for for same-sex couples. That this, and I, for, as I, uh, one of the things I really stress in my sociology classes is that, look, go, you know, what's the imagination toward schools? What's the imagination toward healthcare? What's the imagination? And then we'll get to, when you see what the kind of from the logical point of view the the. Um, deductive approach to things. It's like, what's your deductive idea about something? And then what's your inductive? I think a, a lot of what I'm trying to get at from, like, from the professor here, that Latinos do their, their work on this deductively. They put it together and make the decision. Versus this on high, you know, edict that's coming down. Thank you. Experience is that I think those who are really religious think that the marriage, the marriage vows at church are more important than civil. But I think for the vast majority of people, I think they're most equal. And and the fact is very, you know, and sometimes some Latins, the rate of church marriage is really low. So Mexico is really high. Central American countries are low. They <coughs> low for marriage in the church. So depending on the country, you know. Um, that's what I'll leave that, because it's complex. Um, <clears throat> so it's good that we have a sociologist here, right? Um, because in some ways, like, I, I, I'm happy to be part of this conversation, but I, I can't speak to any of this from uh, from this kind of level of expertise and knowledge about what's happening around. I mean, I'm, I'm a li 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 literature professor, right? That's, that's what I do. And so I'm not a historian. Not a social scientist, and it seems to me that a lot of these questions, um, my my field of expertise is not does not qualify me to talk about it um, with, with this kind of with this kind of uh, of work, right? Um, it's just it's, it's not really what I study, right? So to the extent that um, you know, I'm I'm fascinated by the um, the, the, the sort of the, the really dramatic shifts in. Um, in the terrain, in, in the ways that these different kinds of formations relate to one another, in ways that I think that Joe just really 
you know, beautifully and clearly kind of spelled out, right? Um, it's very fascinating to me to look at um, what's happening, especially in terms of, of you know, what's happening on the ground in Latino America right now, in the ways that um, both of these, I mean, these are the, sort of the twin, um, uh, you know, prevailing uh, questions about sort of like the direction of civil rights in this generation and into the next one. And one is about marriage equality, and the other is about immigration, to the extent that that is, you know, primarily, if not exclusively, about accommodating Latino communities and Latino populations more fully into American life, right? Um, I think that um, there is there's a lot happening um, both at the local level, but in the ways that the, 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 the sort of the aggregate of these local formations are doing something national and, and even international that I think is really, really exciting and really, really kind of um, uh, uh, unprecedented, right? But um, but it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a really, really dramatically uh, acceleratingly moving picture, um, and I, you know, I, I think that, that mostly it's going in a really, really good direction. But I think it's going to stay very complicated and very uneven and very, very heterogeneous for for, for for a long time, right? So um, I think that, um, and I will say nothing about what happens in Latin America. I really am not a Latin American and I kind of don't study it, right? Um, I mean, I, I'm a, I have amateur knowledge of it that that's not any any more. Any, any more authoritative than anybody else in this room might have. Um, but I think on the end in the US you know, scene, um, I would say that some of the some of the factors that I would add to the analysis that Joe's already kind of put on the table, right, is that it feels to me that um, class, geography, and generation, right, are all really, really potent factors when we're talking about this stuff, right? So for example, um, how different sort of Latino populations and the Latino communities think about their relationship to um, religious organizations, religious or institutions, sort of feel a need one way or another to sort of um, plug in and claim certain forms of religious belonging. Um, those are oftentimes uh, motivated by class. Right? They're really motivated by, um, you know, uh, uh, you're, and, and I think I, I, I'm fascinated by this whole idea that part of the sort of draw of um, evangelical Protestant Christianity is that it does sort of um, promote more than like like traditional more forms of Catholicism or other traditional practices the the, um, the formation of the nuclear family as opposed to the extended or the irregular family, right? Um, but something more along the kind of like Anglo-American or mainstream American model that's really fascinating. Um, but it seems to me that that, that yeah, you know, it, it depends on where where uh, a the, the kinds of the kinds of, of, of work that these that, that these particular communities are have available to them and that define them are the ways that they think about their their relationship to society or their relationship to the, the prevailing political economy. I think that obviously the difference between uh, urban and rural is crucial. Um, the difference between your location in a red state and a blue state is crucial, right? Um, and within that, again, urban and rural matters. Um, but I also think that yeah, it's it's a. Uh, uh, you know, class obviously has a relationship to education that we could probably talk about some more. Um, uh, and, and, and yeah, generation. I think that um, uh, the ways that um, uh, Latino populations in this country going forward will find themselves, um, you know, forming around different kinds of, of institutions of belonging and kinship, right, will change because of the different kinds of, 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 of Resources and the, different, and the different sort of opportunities for shifting status, right? Um, that, that, that we're just going to have going forward. And once um, immigration policy is settled, and something like uh, uh, you know the, the, the next sort of moment in in, in, the, in, in the in the process that that marriage equality is sort of undertaking, right, will say a lot about what happens for at least a generation. Um, um, and so more Latinos would feel comfortable being here legally and sort of exploring more fully realized lives, right? And in, in increasingly in more states where there are going to be, there's going to be this opportunity for, for marriage equality, right? Um, and especially at the, at the federal level, if DOMA's um, uh, declared unconstitutional, what that'll, what that'll do is sort of to change federal law, right? All of this coming together feels like a really, you know, not a perfect storm, but a very, very potent convergence of factors that will change everything in five years. I follow up with that. Um, I, I liked what you said, Ricardo, regarding um, class. Um, all, all those three factors, but 
I'll, I'll say this on class. Um, it goes back to your question regarding um, is uh, religious marriage considered higher than civil marriage? Um, what I found working with immigrants in California is, and I think I think this is true of working class people in general. So I don't think it's just the immigrants, but working class Latinos uh, and immigrant Latinos who are may try to make it for the first time. Um, Having a church wedding in the United States goes, their image then goes, their imagination goes to this American wedding. And, and, and it, it, it's a damn costly event. Okay. And so, who, you know, if people get married, they, usually people get married to the church, they go from Porto Cidio, Porto Iglesia, in a short time. But if you put it off, it just gets put off. And then, like, how long do you go before you actually then have the religious wedding that doesn't look weird? Do you have the three kids? Okay. Yeah. So there's there's a drama here that that, is, yeah. that, yeah. that gets really complex. I wonder if anyone's written about this, you know, in literature. You know, because be a great, it would be a great story to tell. You yeah. know, like this dilemma of, of a of a couple like they have grandchildren already and they're going to get married. Okay, so how do, you, how do you solve this problem in a lot of places in the Southwest? I, mean, I know this is in some of the is, is this phenomenon of group wedding. I did this in Hollywood, you know. We had group weddings, and we'd have three or four couples that we would say, look, we'll have you all come together, and the parish will pay for the, for the reception. And, and you all each have your own bridal party, but, you know, you have no pictures, you don't have, you have your own cake. But, you know, just to get you married in the church. You know, this is like getting them married in the church to make them finally legitimate, so to speak. I find it's amusing. Um, but uh, but to, to make, get them into the sacrament, you know, was that effort. And, you know, it, some people took advantage of it. But, you know, for most people, after a year, it's not going to happen. You know, because it's just weird, and and they might want they had a plan. We're going to save the money. We're going to have the wedding, but now we've got to get married civilly because of a lot of good reasons, and they just get married civilly. Otherwise, you just you know live together. You know, so the stages of development regarding from dating to living together, and maybe even having kids. Now, then getting civil and married, then to getting church marriage. This can be. God knows, you know, it's complex for a lot of people today. Yeah. You know, for everybody. But it's just, you know, Latinos, it's becomes a bit, especially the cost factor, because when they get this imagination in their head, they got to have the church wedding. That entails the dress, the tuxedos, the reception hall, the band, the mariachis, the, the tailor, the, the, the limousine, and then you've got to get padrinos and madrinas for. You know, for everything, you know, the melas, the the, the, the the DJ, the padrino, the DJ. And I've seen wedding invitations that are just insane. You know, it's like a four page listing of the donors for the wedding. You know? Yeah, really, yeah. It's like, and I, I had an aunt and uncle in uh, near Lubbock, Texas, that they're considered the don and donia of their community. and, and They've been established there for years and years, and it's a farm labor area, and they, they employ farm labor people, and they get, they get hit up. I mean, it's not horrible, but they, they get hit up for all the weddings, all the quinceañeras, and you know, it's like, they're just like, they're like, don't it out. You know, it's like, because they, they are like the, it's an honor. I mean, they, it, would, it, it gives them a sense of prestige to have the misleading couple. You know, as you know, head of whatever the donor list is, that's going to come in for this extravaganza, and and so people who don't have the money then end up going soliciting for the people in their family and their you know properties and commodities, you know, to get this done. Okay, so given that complexity, then so let's say an immigrant comes here, and they want to, they they meet out, they get married, and then all of a sudden they don't have this network. And I found this true in LA that you know when the baby was 
they're brought into the world, and then they had to get the the um, the videos for the baptism. For the baptism. Some some of the women just couldn't even find the right people. I mean, that was a really hard thing. Like, and who am I going to get that I can trust? Because in a lot of imagination, again, those padrinos are there to take care of the kid if I die. You know, that's part of our Latino imagination. And in fact, in El Salvador, that's the law. Which is an interesting case. It's one of the few Latin countries, I think it's on the left, where the padrinos are, in fact, the legal, you know, guardians of a child if the parents die. Yeah. So this also raises the complexity of how people imagine things and uh, regarding padrinos and madrinas. And I really like the Compro system, which is this, you know, having the padres from Madres and creates an extended family and it creates a spiritual bond among the relationships. In my own family, our closest friends are those people, and, and they, you know, they stay together thick and thin, and it's really nice. And I think some of that's deteriorating, you know, in our in our culture, because people don't know each other, and it's really hard to find people to trust. Well, no, this is why I think it's important to think about the differences among sort of these these uh, populations and where they land, and how, how long they can sort of establish themselves and and allow certain kinds of relationships like this to develop and then to be stable across like half a generation or more, right? Um, so I, I think, it, again, it just, it just feels to me like it's impossible to make certain kinds of generalizations just because the, the, the conditions on the ground just feel so heterogeneous to me. So I'm thinking about like the difference, and, and again, they're, they're very different and distinct, and again, always changing guys for histories that we're talking about. So like if I try to think, if I try to sort of imagine what life is probably like in a really diverse Latino city like Miami, right? Um, that's going to be really different than, than, than what life is going to be like in LA or Chicago or New York um, or, you know, or San Antonio, right? Um, and and they, these are cities that have very, very different relationships to um, Latin American migration, but they will all have meaningful ones, right? They have a very different relationship to sort of like Latino establishment and, um, uh, and accommodation and assimilation. Um, and they will have very different sort of relationships to something like larger and, and potent uh, forms of like Latino political power and authority, right? So all of that is on the table. Um, I think, you know, in terms of, of you know, a, another sort of wrinkle that we can add to this, right, would have to do with, with sort of marrying outside of the population, right? Marrying outside of the community and marrying other people, especially once, you know, you get there, right? Um, not just not just you know heterosexual marriage, but but the, the gay marriage too, right? Um, that it just feels to me again. This is sort of a version of what I've seen before that we're sort of observing something like a very intense, potent form of modernity kind of presenting itself. Um, you know, finally, kind of in this new and, and really unprecedented way. And I think that if we add sort of like again the background that Joe gave us in terms of the march of, of marriage equality laws in all these other countries. You know, that it might be happening for, for a lot of different reasons, but, um, you know, uh, for Spain and Portugal in a European setting, it makes sense that this is where Europe is going, this is where Western Europe is going. I think increasingly in Latin America, the more affluent the country, the likelier, but also the country that, that actually is likely to, to, to be both more affluent in a tourist destination, right, or where there might be a more active and aggressive form of, of immigration policy going on that you want people to come to your country, right? All of that is going to matter, but the thing that's going to be happening here Again, it will take these older forms of sort of Latino identity and sexual identity with them, but it's it's really it's really marching toward a very very different kind of leader. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, and I, and I would add that um, the gay rights movement in the more affluent cities has really made a difference. I mean, the idea that like in the United States that if you know someone who's gay, you're more likely to vote be in favor of gay rights. So, so the same is true in Latin America, you know, um, and there are more, well, this is my observation of Santiago, Chile, and Mexico City, so this is, these are just my observations. Um, well, it's always been okay if you're wealthy Latin to have, if you're a male, to, you know, you're normally not gay because you have the, your marriage and your children and family, but you have your boy on the side. And your hobbies. Yeah, and, and there are many movies. <laughs> there are many Mexican movies with this motif, you know. And so, you know, watching 
And having that as a motif in Mexican movies is really interesting. You know, there's, there's just like, well, you know, whatever, you know, um, Andre is, you know, leaving and whatever, you know, it's like, you know, but it's, it's also like the same machista culture where you have a woman on the side. So, you know, you get a boy on the side, you get a woman on the side, you know, so that's just, the, you know, really the, the culture. So, so for me, it's not alarming. It's not surprising then that that that's what occur. But I mean, anyway. So, but what, what I'm trying to get at is, it's really the working class and middle classes that have made the gay rights movement in those countries strong. Versus in the United States, you know, it's often been that more well to do and educated gays that were like the spearhead of the gay rights movement. I think it's opposite there. I, I think that uh, in Mexico City, the working class and middle class uh, men and women who have been the stalwarts who have a lot to gain by having their rights, whereas the wealthy, they could do whatever they wanted anyway, you know. So so it's really these people that really needed those rights to, to make sure that they could get them. And I think that, for me, is a remarkable thing. And so, when, in, in, you know, when kids come out and then, it's, you know, it becomes more normal to have gay friends. And I, I was struck because I've been to Chile a lot for Georgetown programs. How many of my... Chilean friends are so proactively gay, and um, and and all of them have said, "Well, my uncle's gay, or my brother's gay, and this is a person's gay." And, you know, they come out, and, and there's a strong gay rights movement in Argentina, in Chile, you know, in in Bogota, in Medellin, you know, in Mexico City for sure, and as as in Brazil, Brazil huge. Yeah. As Ricardo said. Uh, uh, tourism makes a big difference too because there's a lot of intersection then, you know, with tourists coming in and, and meeting these people, gays and lesbians, who are not scary. You know, they're bringing dollars to our country, you know, and, and you know, they're like other tourists and we want to get along with them. And so it's not surprising that you have, you know, gay parties in all of the Mexican resort cities for sure, in Brazil, and, and, uh, Okay, stop, you know, great cruises that stop in different cities. You know, I was part of a conference with uh, the State Department um, last year, and I was asked to give a report on the state of religion and gay rights in the region, in the Southwest Hemisphere, so Caribbean and Latin America. And what struck me during the research for that, for that, for that presentation was the Caribbeans are horrible. So, um, all the English-speaking Caribbean countries are bad, really bad. Jamaica, the local Caribbean, the, bad. yeah, the Caribbean's bad. <laughs> but something about the rest of the continent, the continental countries are are doing well, except for Honduras. I mean, so let me think this through. Honduras is the worst case of Central America, and the other countries are getting better. Um, Mexico is really good. Costa Rica, Costa Rica is really good, yeah. and and Costa Rica is exceptional in many ways. Um, and in, Latin, in the in the sub, in the you know Latin Latin America, um, let's say, uh, let me say South America. Um, um, Colombia is getting really good in terms of cities, and they're passing ordinances and laws for gay rights. Um, Venezuela is iffy. Um, Brazil is really getting really good. Argentina is really good. Chile is going to pass probably marriage equality next year. And, and even the, the, you know, the present president, Pineda, conservative, Opus Dei, is for civil unions. You know, so that's telling a lot about the uh, affluent, affluent Latin country, or even Chile, which had many people thought was very conservative, you know, post um, you know, is fine. I was struck, I was listening to the debate for the Argentinian passage of marriage equality. Um, I, I was so lucky because I found this video station where I could get the coverage. And um, uh, I was really struck by comments from some of the legislators that were saying, who is the church to tell us what to do when they were supporting dictatorship? Yeah, yeah. so there, there's also resentment toward the Catholic Church or religious leaders coming out you know, against the group for civil rights or human rights when they weren't there for human rights and civil rights during a critical time for everybody. So, in, and the last thing I want to say regarding that, it's not part of the question, but let me restore it. The sexual abuse scandal has also, I can throw that in, in the Catholic Church, because in the United States, 
who was hit the most, what group was hit the most, that, you know, in, especially Southwest, and in you know, some of the other states, Latino kids, Hispanic boys, were hit the hardest. They were taken advantage of by Anglo priests who saw, you know, that they had these vulnerable situations with their family lives, and they were taken advantage of. I think that's an undercurrent for distrust for anything the church says about anything. And um, um, I know, I don't know, I didn't tell, say this you know, at the beginning, but I, I was very much responsible for helping plan Catholic strategy for marriage equality in, in the four campaigns that we just had in 2011, and in 2012. And one of the things I was telling, you know, how do we plan, you know, it's obviously I'm highly opinionated on this, how do we plant doubt among Catholics regarding their hierarchy, regarding statements, you know, and to do that stuff, because you can't just like, you can't be just out there, it has to be subtle, okay, but that's a subtlety to this issue, you know, that, can, who can you trust with your children, and who are they to tell us what to do about being sexual? That was your philosophy <laughs> <laughs> Not secular agnostic atheist for part of what it is. You know what? I come from a fairly conservative Catholic family. And that the sexual abuse scandal really brought a level of distrust to my to my uh, siblings who are pretty conservative mm -hmm. Catholics. And um, I think that's that's true among a lot of Catholics, that there's this level of distrust. The Catholic hierarchy, and so they're gonna. If a priest goes up to a pulpit and you know, spout something about gay marriage, I, I think it's gonna. I don't think it's gonna be received well because of the nature of the situation of sexual abuse scandal. Mm -hmm. I'd like, I really like the point that I mentioned earlier about how, like, so, sort of the whole discourse of the of us, like, how the moral, how we derive morals, and just like how the family is a basic moral. So I think, like, it would be better to see something that has a lot of work with the media and the media, and just like how, how you frame the, the discourse around, like, the family, so like, the love of the family, and how we sort of use it, into the connection. So it's just like the way it's described and like that's probably the best way to see what the body is doing. It's just like looking at the family as a family that's going to be the church. Yeah, you know, um, it's, again, I just have to go back to this point. I just think that things are moving so fast across these last couple of generations. So like, you know, I mean, Joe and I are both old enough that we remember when none of this was thinkable, right? When none of this was imaginable, like reading Free Stone Wall, 1970s, um, uh, certainly three days. Um, uh, and so, you know, this obviously still happens to young people today, but I do think it's a really, really different sort of game just because of the, the fact that we just didn't even have the messages out there. There was nothing on television and nothing nothing that we could see in the public arena that could tell us that we had, you know, a representable existence, let alone, um, you know, a right to expect anything better than, than, than what was presented to us to begin with, right? Um, and, and just, um, yeah, I mean, watching this happen, like, through my, my own experience with my, with my family, right? And so, um, thinking all the way through my adolescence and into my 20s, that, A, you know, I, I could never tell my parents, um, and that there was no one else in my family who was gay. Right? And that um, the day that I did, they disowned me and it would all be over. And that was so all about family, 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 right? Mm -hmm. So I finally told them in my, my mid 20s, which is late now, right? It's like I, I was a coward. I was just sort of <laughs> lazy and a coward. But I finally did it. Um, they did not disown me. It took some work, right? But there was a moment, and it wasn't more than a couple of years after that, that I turned around and realized like, like half the people, not in my generation, but in my parents' generation, were gay. <laughs> right, so older Cubans, right? Yeah. Half of them still on the island, half of them here. And then these are older Cubans who are basically 
coming out with a really different narrative in mind because they're 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 in this country a lot of them are married, you know, in, in straight marriages and everything else. But after 20, 30 years of being here, realizing, oh, I, I I actually do have this freedom and I can explore it here. And um, in all these different ways. So I know at least like one Cuban couple, man or woman, you know, in their 70s, where he came out, they didn't get a divorce because they've been together all their lives, but he's dating guys while they sort of still have this like home together, he and his wife. That, that to me is a way of thinking about like where marriage is going to go in the future. I mean, I really think that even the narrative of, and, and this may be sort of uh, realizing what the conservative backlash or the conservative resistance against letting marriage equality happen, I, I actually do think that in some ways this will change marriage. It will change marriage really profoundly. It will, it will, there will be so many different ways to think about why two people want to be together that actually won't even be about sex anymore. It will be about something else. It can't be about sex. It can't be about love. It can't be about wanting to make that commitment. But I really wonder, and, and not in a bad way, actually, I don't view this, I don't think it's a bad thing, but how how couples happen and why, you know, will, will, will change, will change because of what, what, what we're seeing happen. And it will change cultures, it will change the way we are. We are not, we are not going to bring our traditions into the future. Into the future. That's a good question. Adam, I don't know if you have a talk about this, but one of the things that I've noticed in speaking from Central America, especially difference on where a person goes to identify as, as a transgender. Um, and and so therefore in much of Latin America, I don't I think I think Argentina actually allows for payment for surgery in the healthcare system. It's, the healthcare system is so liberal. And people go there who aren't even Argentinians to go and get health care because it's that open. Uh, be that as it may, um, I think it's cost factor. It's also how is how is the community looked at, and the transgender community here in the United States is, I think, a very exceptional thing right now in terms of worldwide issues. Uh, and in terms of marriage, this complicates things. I have a friend in Austin, Texas, who is a transgender woman, male to you know, female. And she she identifies as lesbian. She married her lesbian partner, but got actually married in Texas using her male identity. Okay, when she did that, I was furious. But I understood it at the same time. She was protecting her marriage and her child. But that's where it gets really weird and complicated, you know, with, with transgender marriage. Because transgender, getting married, is not an issue in our country right now. If you're transgender, you can get into gay marriage easily. <clears throat> well, it's, 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 it's complicated. It's complicated. Right? So, so this thing that I was talk, saying about, about where we're going to be in another generation, right? <laughs> this is part of it, too. So gender is absolutely on the table, right? In, a way, in the same way that marriage is, or, or differently, but just as sort of potent, right? And so, um, you know, right now, like, um, you know, I, I do a lot of sort of sexuality study stuff, but mostly through literature, right? Um, we went from being sort of gay and lesbian literature, uh, gay and lesbian studies to being, you know, 
queer studies in about a decade. Queer studies right now, um, you know, and we don't call it LGBTQ studies in terms of like what the academic intellectual project is. Queer studies is absolutely right now living in the space of transgender and disability studies. It's really moved way, way, way away from, you know, more conventional questions about gender and even, even sort of conventional questions about sexuality and sex and pleasure and identity to this other place of so thinking about sort of the non-normative <coughs> body, right, in the future of the non-normative body. And I, I absolutely think that um, uh, in, in ways that we're only just starting to feel out and, and it'll, 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 it'll come from very, very different locations and not, not exclusively from, from elite sites and culture, but, but really from, from working class and um, just from all these places where people can finally say, okay, I, I don't have to sort of be confused about this thing that I am because there's a discourse out there about it that allows me to understand that this is what's happening to me, this is, this is my... You know, this is my condition of life, and, um, and and the ways that people are going to think about how you know they can they can they can convert their anatomy right into um, something that that feels to them more like who they are right. I think that we're just opening that door now. There's going to be, going to be, this is this is going to change the, change things for us. It's it's way beyond cross-dressing. It's really transgender. Yeah, I, I you know my personal feeling about a lot of the changes that are taking place here. I mean. And then it's like coming out of the marriage issue, and then we can extend it to all the other issues, like my friend getting married, you know, in Austin. Um, like a pregnant man, right? So, yeah, so, yeah, that, that, so yeah. he goes from being, he's transitioning from female to male, but he keeps his reproductive organs, right, so that he can have children, yeah. and you have this, but you know, every way to present as a man, except for the fact that he actually, you know. Yeah. So what, what, do, what do you do with that? Right? Well, so, so so yeah, so when, I'm, when, I, when I am, um, Really interested in, and actually, you know, because I'm going to be going to Betty Ford Center, I and mean, I think we are actually going to be counseling these issues regarding addiction and, and you know, alcoholism and drug addiction because some of these things are so complicated that people end up in, in, in vulnerable situations and, and handle issues through drinking and drugs. So, that's so the complexity there with addictions. Mm -hmm. But also, I do think that a lot of people are not spiritually and, and psychologically prepared for a lot of shifts that they make decisions regarding their lives. I think I think when people make major decisions like that, even with getting married, I think they need help to help go through questions regarding the decision. You know, I really do like the fact that we have the church. One of the things I did enjoy as a parish priest and or even marrying helping uh, officiate at weddings today is uh, I like to you know meet with the couple and, and go through the steps of like how did you meet? You know, the ceremony means something, so what does it mean? You know? You know, why are you having this ceremony? I mean you could just live together, but you know, what does it mean? And then even people going through divorces or separation. You know, what does it mean to go from what you made the decision for to then change your decision? You know, and I think this is real problematic in American culture, and I would say suggest in the culture too, is that people are not not often getting the supports that they need to go through major decisions that are so complex. And we don't have the systems in place. And I think that's the next also the next stage, like how do we get other things in place to assist people going through these major life issues. So just like the question, because even now there's parents who like their kids tell them like at the age of six that I transgender and right. don't identify this. Right. So would you personally be like, against the idea of a parent stopping their child from like, putting their child on form of therapy at the age of six for them to not transition into the form? Well, that won't be allowed to. I don't think it is an intersex. I don't think I don't think it would be allowed to have sufficient reason at that age to actually have an operation. It's not an operation for the therapy. Oh, the therapy. The Yeah. Well. So there's three cases in Massachusetts, all right? People are like, you can't do this. They're not six years old, but the child is born knowing that they're not in their right gender. Right. Yes. Is it a choice that they can make at six years old? There's a great project in California called the Family Acceptance Project that has been wrestling with this, and Caitlin um, Ryan is the psychologist who has been studying these things with children. And um, I've seen a couple of videos out of the case studies that they have. They're amazing in terms of, you know, kind of with the you know, children going through, um, um, I'll just 
for lack of better words, and I don't think these are the right words, but gender identity um, issue, gender, gender identity crisis, um, you know what I mean. Uh, you know, that, you know, who am I? And, you know, um, I want to be in a dress where, you know, you want them to put me in boys' clothes. And um, actually, it feels, I mean, I find these very interesting from a cultural angle, like, does the dress determine the gender? You know, so so you just want to dress up, you know, and those are like, it, what's the identity and how does the the, the, the outward appearance of the, inner, mm -hmm. of the inner experience reflect? Those are interesting questions to me, like, and, um, you know, the, you know, all the, some of the queer stuff, you know, like, um, doing, um, I guess, um, uh, what is it? Um, like tra transgressive kinds of activity, you know, to assert oneself. Um, I don't think six year old is doing that. But I do think it's, it really it's raising all the complexities that we thought was when our first race here. Yeah, you know, um, so yeah, I actually sort of have to break out my, my theory to to help, <laughs> to help kind of like analyze this because I think this is the level at which we're, we're analyzing this, right? So, um, one of the things that's been working in this conversation a little bit, it's not just doing it, we just do it right, is that um, we are having trouble with this question of like. I'm so sorry to interrupt you guys. I'm actually having some isn't it? It's 8.15. Okay. Okay. We'll be out in two minutes. It's actually the perfect time. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Thank you. It does have to do with the ways that we think about um, uh, essentialism, right, and, and what it means to um, uh, want to assert something like um, your, your whatever your, your, your essential sort of quality or condition of your being is, right? And that's how we still sort of think about this. That if you know what happens when a when, when a when a child, right, when a relatively young child wants to begin to assert this to a culture that wants them not to be the thing that they think that they are, right? That essence. But I think that the the, the, the more the probably more complicated way to think this, right, is that as parenting changes, right, as parenting strategies change, as parenting becomes more and more, more enlightened about the ways that we do gender our children from the time that they're very young in order to conform to these expectations that society has, just questioning that in a way that the generation go, no one questioned it, right, opens the door, opens the space of possibility, then more young children will realize that they can sort of go into it and go, okay, no, who knows what I really am, or even like if that's really what we're talking about here. But for now, I know that I don't want to wear pants. And I don't want to play with a drum. And I don't want to play a war. Let me worry rest. Right? That that's a fascinating thing that's happening. But I think in general, I think that the, the thinking that we need to do about what that means, again, in the generation we might we might be in a really different place about it. But we're going to keep going in that direction. We're not. We're not going to backtrack. Because this is. We've already opened that door. And you know, I think it really will be fascinating to see how it's. And again, it's just that the kids will take these messages from their parents and realize, oh, I can say no to that. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 so happy to be at the Metro Con uh, the conference and then now this, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a fitting way to have my last week at Georgetown. Thank you so much. And I have to go to the Green Lake to the So best of luck everyone. Thank, thank you. you.